Thank you everyone for participating and being involved. Uh, we, as I know most of you know the Carnegie people who are here as they were walking around. I think that, um, I'm, I'm sure you know Erin, she's been here a lot, Erin Smith. Um, Christina or Kristen. Uh, Kristen, um, who's also from Carnegie, Tyree, who's done a lot of work with um, Mastream, Jamie Sterling, who's one of the product developers of the Mastream, uh, Jerry Comer, who does all the data, who like I hassle every single day of the week. Uh, when you guys have a problem, he's my go-to person. Of course, you all know Sue and Monica and Tina just presented. So who we have here today is Robert, um, a Duke who came here. He's one of the math stream influences. I'm sure the kids were so excited at Ashfield today. It was really a great day. They gave him a lot of feedback on the math stream, as well as just you know the excitement. It was really cool. We met with all the eighth grades. He did a great function lesson. I actually just shared it with some eighth grade teachers. Great strategy. But with no further ado, I welcome them up here and no <laughs> Please give him your undivided attention. Those are some way. No school is how we phone. That's what I keep telling high school. Right? So we're not going to have our phone done. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi. Hey. Can we take one collective breath together? Can we do it? Let's do it. One, two, three. I don't take this time for granted. I know you've been in sessions, and uh, I'm in that with you. So I appreciate your presence. I appreciate doing this with you. And I hope you walk away with something that resonates with you as much as it does for me. So the first thing that I'll ask, you know, I have to take this off here, is jumping straight to the core of the matter, what you think the student's greatest fear is. I mean, isn't that really what we're really talking about, ultimately? If we want to inspire them, we have to remove blockages. So what are some, what are the fears, the deepest fears that you think students experience? Yeah, go ahead, call it out. Failure. Failure, fear of failure. Yeah, we've heard that one. Yes. Yeah. What else? Embarrassment. Embarrassment. Yes, yes. Yeah, being wrong, which even by itself is neutral, but they've stigmatized it as bad. Right, right. These are good, embarrassment, fear of failure, getting it wrong, maybe one more? Hard. Too hard, their fear that it's too hard, right. So you, who said too hard? Hey, hi, what's your name? Sarah. Hey, Sarah. So embarrassment, too hard, we're gonna talk about the opposite of hard, it's easy, a little later today, about what it means to be easy. But to me, the biggest uh, fear underneath all of it that really speaks to the examples that we heard today, today is this concept of inadequacy. And that's the fear, I believe, because it, it ascends into adulthood, right? We don't want to be inadequate in front of our peers, in front of our teacher, in front of our families, in front of our employers, in front of every social group that we have. And so if we're talking about eradicating this fear of anxiety, I actually have been thinking about this a lot, and I thought, what better way to explore it than with a really fun and safe prank? to explore that trope, and it was an April Fool's prank. And before you get concerned, right, I believe we all lead with love with our students. One of the mantras about pranking is, confuse, don't abuse. So you have to lead with love, right, when you're doing a prank. But here's the prank, and it's pretty, it's pretty fire, as the kids say. Anyway, so this is what it was. <laughs> half the students were away on a field trip. While they were gone, the other half and I conspired to when they return, that we would teach a lesson that made absolutely no sense, but then pretend that it does. And we would watch as the turning students' minds slowly unraveled before us. And so we did that. Would you like to see a video of it? Yes. All right, cool. Okay, while we get that started, one, can I just define the term what math anxiety is? Let's define the term because it, it's a, uh, it's a scientific definition. We'll get the term out of the way because it's fascinating and it's really interesting, right? And it has to do with the amygdala. So this is what math anxiety is. Stanford University did studies on this. When the fear centers of our brain are, are active, 
fight, flight, fear, fawn. When the parasympathetic system is triggered, when adrenaline is coursing through our bodies, the processes of the parts of our brain that are responsible for doing numbers shut down. We are not wired to do math when we are in a state of fight or flight. It's, it's akin to looking at a light bulb and asking whether the light bulb works when there is a power outage. You would never ask that question. And what happens is, I think of the amygdala or the fear center of the brain, here we go, as a gremlin, the, the, the little reptile, the gremlin. The, this, how do gremlins sit? There you go. And I just gremlin that seat. Okay. This is a gremlin, right? Gremlin's got his hand on the switch in your mind. Now call out some of those fears we heard before. What was it? Where is it? Who said it? Embarrassment. Call it out. Embarrassment. Yeah, let's get this kid. Who's got more fears? Give it to me. More fears. Give me fears. What are fear students afraid of? Tigers. In the classroom, baby. That okay, here you go. We'll come back to Gremlin. We'll come back to Gremlin. Go ahead. And then that creates a line right below the 3 4. So that would be 3 3. If Wait, I could grab what? it. So, no questions, yeah. Um, I have no idea what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going on. I'm so I have no Thank you for asking. I have no idea. I knew this would happen. That's why I sort of left. I, I figured it would happen. Yeah, can you help us? Yeah, I did it twice. <laughs> so we have two lines. So <laughs> and it's What happens when you divide something? Over. Yeah, question here. Okay, and then, so, yeah. so my cue is how, what? <laughs> you have to start over. What are you dividing? Like, where did this come from? I don't know. Right. So right. It's a formula that. How do you, like, how do you divide x, y from 3, 4? 3, comma, 4. Good question. How do you divide x, y? You mean, how do you divide 3, 4 I by x, y? I, I literally, I just don't. <laughs> No, I can't wrap, wrap my mind, mind around right, right. any of So now look, n equals 3, so it's going to be positive, right? Yeah. Okay. Which yes. is positive, that's what okay. we're going to So my question, <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> I, wait, wait, time out, time out, time out. Do you not get, I, 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 I don't get, I don't get, okay, I get, okay. You guys, I appreciate that you're asking you questions, have, and I appreciate that you have a good attitude about it. You have sigma It was X, hard for them to. You have sigma X, X Y. Okay, okay, you have sigma X, Y. And we, and, 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 okay, and we sigma said, and sum. we said Duh. it was going to be sum. This is sum of something. Wait, we said that X, X1, Y1 is going to be 3, 4. Is this going to be? So, okay, then. <laughs> He's trying so hard. I love it. You're so curious. I am so lost. What's going on? No, finish your question. I'm, I'm, I was just like reliving the moment with them that this happened before. That's why Leah's laughing. <laughs> he was uncomfortable, but he was laughing, right? That, that's the, the thread that we're trying to needle through. And what we're doing is, the beautiful part of this video to me, the gem underneath, is that that fear center of the brain wasn't triggered, right? So it's going like presentation mode. If you can get it, like, is that it? Is that here? Yeah, here we go. Yeah, that'll do it. That'll do it. Good job. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. So, right, this is the fear center. So we are at the gremlin! The gremlin that doesn't ruin chairs of your schools. We heard fear of failure, embarrassment. Give me one more fear that the students have in class. Being wrong. Being wrong. Ha ha, we got the kid. Schwang! The ability to do the math actually is gone at this moment. And you even as math teachers, as I descend out of gremlin mode, you as math teachers, can you imagine if there was a bump in the night, scratch at the door, and we're out there and we're listening? I'm like, what is that? What is that? Would you act, how would you feel if I asked you, completing the square with A greater than one, please? <laughs> You'd probably be pretty mad at me.
you know, at that moment, because we're not wired that way. We never were wired that way. There's no need to be wired that way. And so many students everywhere, all the time, walk into math class feeling like they can't do the math. That's the problem. They've conflated the fact that their brains are shut down, the math part of their brain is shut down, with the feeling that they can't do math. And if we get to talk about feelings, then we get to talk about culture. And that's part of the fun, right? So during the pandemic, I had a chance to work with students in China uh, remotely uh, in a room much like this. They beam me up in the front and teaching entrepreneurial skills with other Western teachers. That's, that was the job. And I learned so much about how they operate over there. And this is what I learned. For example, a student walks into your, not, let's say a class in China, and turns in the assignment and says, Mr. and Miss Teacher, this took me two hours to do. And the teacher says, respect, wow, you worked really hard on that. I can see that you use colored lines, you stapled the paper, you use graphs, you really tried, you really did your best effort. Other students like, wow, you really went for it on that. Same exact scenario over here. Mr. or Miss Teacher, here's my assignment. It took me two hours to do. What do we say? If a student comes into your class and says, your assignment took me two hours to do, what do we say? <laughs> Should not take so long, we heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's wrong? Oh no, oh my goodness. Did you not get it? And then the other students chime in. It took me 25 minutes, yeah! Gets this nothing for me, right? So how can the same act be interpreted in so many different ways? There's a culture behind learning and that culture is subjective and it's up to us to influence it, right? The purpose is not to make it the opposite of too hard. This is one of my favorite graphs in the world, right, by Hungarian-American psychologist Mihaly. I, I did this one. Uh, I had, I Do you know how many times I Googled this with the freaking audio? I did it I'm, with respect. I'm not going to mince the name. Um, but that is, the, with respect to him, this is what it is. And it's beautiful with math teachers, first quadrant graph, baby, right? I love it. You could see high skills when matched with low challenge leads to boredom. Low skills when matched with high challenge leads to anxiety. And our job is to match the skill with the challenge to create what we all know as a flow state. I love the flow state. You've been in the flow state before? Right? Telltale signs, you're unaware of your body, you don't know if you're tired, you don't know if you're hungry, you don't know if you need to use the bathroom at that moment, you're right there. And it's our job to find a way to not make it easy, but to make it the right challenge. In fact, I would even make a request, a kind request, that we don't use the word easy in class anymore. Because if you hand out a paper, if we hand out a paper, yeah, this is easy, this will be fine for you, this will be fine for you. Then you were, we're suggesting that the goal is to, for things to be easy. And if things get too hard, then it's antithetical to the goal. So rather than that, this is maybe the right challenge, or this is just right for you in that moment. And just something to think about. A quick, um, I'm gonna put this back over here. I'm gonna make a quick distinction because some people get it confused, it's worth pointing out just for the next moment. Math anxiety is not the following. It's not a student comes in unprepared, takes a test, and then feels anxious. It's not that. It's the act of the brain shutting down and blocking that which is already known. So that's just an important thing. It's not the general feelings of anxiety because we're underprepared or something like that. It's the blockage in the brain, all right? And so what's the path out of it? The path out, so beautifully, the path out is baked into the problem itself. Did you know, and this blew my mind, on a neurochemical basis, that when the body releases a surge of anxiety, when we experience that anxiety, it simultaneously releases a surge of oxytocin. And oxytocin is the human connection hormone. 
In other words, the anxiety is also baking in the very solution for it, which is human connectivity. And we all know this on a very, very intuitive level. We know uh, during the pandemic, for example, that life was generally very hard and lots of anxiety was in the air for all of us. We know that. But on an instinctive level, we knew it was doubly hard because the kids were isolated. Why would we say that? Because we instinctively know that in being in a state of anxiety, human connection, human closeness is one of the paths out. I just find that so fascinating that like within the problem is the answer. So, science has proven this. So it turns out that the University of Wisconsin, yeah, I, I, I can't, I'm indecisive because I want to move with you. <laughs> University of Wisconsin did this. They had a brain study in an MRI where they would actually give willing participants a small electrical shock uh, uh, prior to going into the uh, MRI. And they were split into three cohorts. They were do it alone, hold the hand of a stranger, or hold the hand of a loved one. And sure enough, they were right in the brain scan. They can see those fear centers of the brains being activated or not. And sure enough, sure enough, the people that did it isolated, they had the highest levels of anxiety, followed by holding the hands of a stranger, followed by the lowest levels, holding the hands of a loved one. Same actions, everything across the board the same. It's that human connection. How does this translate to the classroom? Well. Have you ever had a student that's uh, having an anxiety moment in class during a test, maybe? Yeah? You ever had that moment? Someone anxious during a test? Has that happened to you? Yeah? Yeah? How about you guys? Has, have you given a test in your classes like someone felt anxious about it? Can we model that moment together, you and I? OK. If you don't want to, it's fine. If someone else wants to, it's totally OK. This one. Okay. What's your name? Amy. Amy. Okay. Let's hear. Hi, Amy. Hi. So you're having a tough time on this test? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I've been there. I've definitely had hard times on tests before, and I know the feeling, and it's not fun. I'm just here to say that no matter what, when this is done, why don't we make a plan so that maybe this won't happen in the future. We'll come up with something. We'll figure it out. One way or another, you're going to be fine. You're separate from the test. Like, you're whole. You're a human being. This is just a piece of paper. It's not who you are. So would you be willing to at least just do your best in this moment? And then afterwards, we'll look at it and figure out what we can do in the future? Yes. Awesome. Are you, uh, can you receive my math vibes? <laughs> I'm sending you math vibes now. Got it. You feeling them? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that with me. And thank you, Amy. Let's give her a hand. Right. Thank you for that. You notice the first thing that I did was I tried to get lower than you, not even eye level, right? To, to diminish the power dynamic, right? Because that's going to be exacerbated. So I lower than you. And I didn't dismiss your feelings. And I did what we need to do to get us out of the rabbit hole, which is to listen to the anxiety. That's the solution. That's the solution. It's to listen. It's a signal. All right. Let's make the distinction between fear and anxiety, right? They're nuanced, but they're very different. Let's say you see a bear. Fear is defined as certain knowledge of an imminent threat. If you see a bear, if we see a bear, we will experience fear. That is not anxiety. Anxiety is a chance for us to become time travelers. Anxiety, on the other hand, is defined as having apprehension about a future outcome that may or may not have happened, may or may not happen. 
So with the bear, for example, let's say we're going camping and we heard that bears are in the area. So we start to feel anxiety. What am I going to do? What, 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 that, uh, will the bear be there? So those are important distinctions. And up to now in our culture, there have been two schools of thought about how to deal with anxiety at, at, at large within, let's say, you could say American culture or Western culture at least, and both of those are flawed. We're gonna debunk both of them and talk about what we talked about with Amy, about the act of listening to that anxiety. The first is ignore the anxiety. Can you imagine if we had a smoke detector? Beep, 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 beep. They were like, I'm just gonna go to this room now. <laughs> oh, it's like, it's bothering me. Yeah, it's better over here. We would never do that with a smoke detector, much like we can never dismiss the internal message that anxiety is trying to communicate to us. It's a compass. And it actually can lead us to feelings of resolution. So here's an incredible, incredible study. You can look this up as well. They're arguably the most difficult and uh, uh, intricate types of procedures one could get is heart transplant, right? We know this. And so there's a lot of pre-procedure, uh, uh, um, basically, like there's a lot of preamble to the procedure and a lot going on after it, right? And they date, collect a lot of data. Besides the biometric data, they ask, how are you feeling? Are you anxious? How, what's your mental state? What's your psychological state? Right, and they report it on a scale of one to 10. I'll put it to you, it's a question for you. For those people prior to their transplant, who reported higher levels of anxiety, do you think that was associated with better outcomes with their procedure or worse outcomes? What do you think? Everyone thinks worse at first. It's entirely logical to think worse because if you, and anecdotally, someone has a heart condition and they're stressed, and you're like, don't stress, don't stress. Your heart, your heart, don't do it. But, but data shows, look, I think there is a threshold of stress that we may not, we can't cross, right? But let's say we're talking about anxiety. We're specifically talking about anxiety. And it turns out that those people that report higher levels of anxiety have better outcomes. Why? Because maybe they listened to the message. Maybe they took their medications. Maybe they went to the doctors more often. Maybe they were voracious researchers on the internet. Maybe they listen to the doctor about what they should be eating or what their sleep patterns should be. And that to me is solid goal. I love the fact that it's a message so we can't ignore. The next school of thought is to eliminate. To eliminate. Smoke detector. I'm just gonna take the battery out of this thing. Okay, that's better. We can't eliminate the message of anxiety because it conveys a very, very detrimental message, let's say, to our students. If we eliminate the source of anxiety, then we're communicating to them that you're too fragile to deal with this. That's what we're doing. And I experienced this firsthand with my own daughter last year. She was eight years old, just around this time. She was putting on her shoes. It was a rainy day. She had these like, rain boot things that are stiff and hard to put on. And she was sitting on the step. I remember the look on her face. I'll tell you why. And it wasn't cooperating. And she did one of these things. Like that. Right, and my heart immediately went out to her. But then I stopped what I was about to say. Because I remembered three days prior, I had the same exact moment. This is my daughter. Because I had the same exact thing in a different capacity. It was 10.36 at night, I remember the time. It's just strange like that. I was to do the dishes. I was dilly-dallying. I didn't manage my time well. It's like, oh, I gotta do these dishes. So I start doing them and my hands were wet. I was like, ah, oh, let me put the gloves on. So I put the gloves on and they wouldn't go on because my hands were wet and I did the same thing she did, right? Do you think in the moment that I was experiencing that thing that I want coaching from, let's say, my wife being like, honey, your hands are wet. You can't put on the gloves that way. That won't work. <laughs> Do you think I wanted that feedback? I want her to like tell me how to eliminate my anxiety, basically. And so you think of it with a little kid, your students, any, anyone else, your parents, 
there's a lot of crossover. It's the same sentiment that I could have said, let me loosen the laces for you. Let me pull the thing out. Let me help you with the tongue. Honey, da -da -da. honey this, honey that, honey the other. But I remembered what I did. And fortunately, that time, I was able to say, how can I help you? And just let it lie. Let it rest there. You know that the term safe space has been used a lot in our public lexicon, the cultural term, right? It's kind of a controversial term. I would like us to redefine safe space. I want to take the term back. I believe in safe spaces, but in this capacity. We're not safe from having big feelings. We're safe to have big feelings. And if that's the space that we can conjure in our classrooms for our students, safe to have those big feelings. The ability for them to listen to the message, to not judge themselves, to have curiosity about what the anxiety is trying to communicate, to come up with a plan. Then through that, instead of eliminating the smoke detector, it will gradually diminish on its own, and we actually empower the kid to deal with the life challenges that we are all presented with. It's no different than the argument that we have as adults. So I want to show you something cool, because emotion is not a disorder. That's the takeaway. And having emotions is not something like you're not you, let's not say I'm anxious anymore because, or let it, I'm just anxious. Well, what is that? What are you trying to do? What, what can we do? How can we help you? This is a player named Vernon Davis, and he is interacting with this coach here at the time, Mike Singletary, uh, who was a coach for one year, then he was fired because of moments like this. So imagine this is our student, and we are the coach, right? Is the message being heard right now? Is there something being communicated that's not listened to? In fact, you could even think about this metaphysically, right? If you know anything about internal family systems, that field of psychology, we're all composed of various parts. It's fascinating, you can look it up. We're all composed of various parts, and our anxiety is a part of us. It's not a demon, it's not a monster, it's not something that's a disorder. It's trying to commu communicate something to the self, in this case, the coach. So there's a metaphysical component. This very same player, the very next year, has this reaction crying in the arms of his next coach by the name of Jim Harbaugh. And I find that fascinating, that on, if a professional can go from walled off and standoffish and closed down to crying in a space of one year, then what can we do with our students? What type of vulnerability can we create with them? Here's a video for it of that moment. For Vernon Davis, Alex Smith, Frank Gore, a lot of these guys that have been here for a long time, fought through some very difficult years with the 49ers. And what a great day this is for them right now. That's why they love this guy. They will do anything for this guy. Look at Jim Harbaugh with Vernon Davis. That is awesome. A lot of this concept of anxiety I, I picked up from the Hidden Brain podcast. If you definitely want to check that out, it's, it's a beautiful messaging system behind this. And the fact that our anxiety or fears, let's say, of math or anything otherwise, can be learned. So back to the aforementioned daughter. If math, fear, or anxiety can be learned, then it can be unlearned. And this is one five-year-old's take in closing about how math is not as scary as needles or haunted houses. <laughs> and if one little girl can think that way about math, then maybe all of them can. What advice would you give to people that maybe are afraid of math? There's no hitting, there's no slapping, 
There's no pushing, there's no grabbing, there's no vet, there's no haunted houses, there's no needles, there's no poking, there's no roughness. Just take it easy because there's none of that things. Okay, bossy pants. So now you poodles, bye bye. <laughs> I love this so much because it's a state of pureness. Thank you. If you're invited now, if you'd like to sign up, it's totally invitational. It's all direct from me. If you'd like insights about how to connect to students, all written directly from me, that's the way to stay in touch with me and sign up. And other than that, I really appreciate it and thank you for your time for being here today.